Welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. From humble beginnings as a startup to becoming one of the biggest banks in the country, Access Bank has done this through mergers and acquisitions of other banks over the years. Joining us now to talk about the bank's latest merger with Diamond Bank PLC is the managing director, Herbert Wigwe. Welcome to the morning show. Great pleasure. Good morning. Morning. So I'm going to start off with a look back at your past 16 years, when right. yourself and your partner, Ivo J. Aigemokwede, yeah. left GTB with dreams of owning and managing the biggest bank in the country. Today, you now own and will be managing the biggest bank in Africa in terms of retail base. Right. How does this feel? It's a great feeling. <laughs> um, but I think what is more important is not how big you are, but what we're doing for the country. Um, I think that for us, what is critical is what we're doing as far, as far as financial inclusion is concerned, as far as deepening the financial markets is concerned and all of that. Nigeria has there's a, not a positive narrative about the country outside, yet we have such a great economy, we have great people. The fact that this is coming out of the country, all right, means that we can support local businesses to become global champions. For me, that is the greatest thing about this, this particular merger. Again, unlike your closest rival, which is Zenith Bank and GTV, uh, you've chosen this path of growth, this strategy of um, you know, inorganic growth to acquire or to merge. Why did you choose this strategy? We have a very unique history. At the time at which we came into um, running access, it was a very little bank. And it was clear to us that organic growth was not the only way to get to where we wanted to get to. And so we knew that inorganic growth was the best way all right, for us to pursue to get to become, becoming one of the strongest and largest banks in the, in the country. Now, our comparator banks um, have done an excellent job at creating a very fine institution. I'm talking about the two banks you referred to. You can't even take it away from them. Uh, but they came earlier than us in time. Now, if you look world over, the top five banks in every country would typically control 75 to 80 percent of market share. It is in the UK, it is in the United States, etc. And so for us, we were certain and hell-bent on ensuring that we had that kind of skill. Skill is critical, all right? So for us today, um, getting to that type of skill is one that we're extremely proud of, and that unique history, um, and the, of course, the fact that over time, we've been able to build significant experience as far as measures and acquisitions are concerned is one that, that we remain extremely proud of. I don't think there's any Nigerian bank that has gone through as much many measures as we have. There's been strong learning points. There's also been weaknesses and areas where we've, we've made mistakes. But I think today we're finer than ever before, um, just from the sheer um, skill that we've developed over time. So now that Access Bank and Diamond Bank have announced the merger in principle, what are the next steps that the transaction is going to take? Can you give us a timeline? We need to go through various regulatory approvals. We need court sanctions. We need shareholders to meet and approve and all of that. Um, we believe that before the end of the second quarter of next year, uh, we should have concluded legal merge. But the beauty of this particular arrangement is the fact that we are working with our brothers and sisters in Diamond to protect market share, to continue to build customer confidence, to ensure that the merger is value accretive. So before the end of the first half of next year, it would, would have concluded legal merge. I think around about April, that should have happened. But really, what kind of value creation and synergy are you bringing to the shareholders? Phenomenal. I think. If you compare the two of us, there's so much complementarities, all right? Access Bank brings a strong wholesale banking business. And over time, we've basically perfected the art of what we refer to as, um, you know, it's, it's a network strategy that basically supports uh, the value chain, if you like. And that was our own way of getting into retail. We also are very strong in treasury, we're strong in risk management, and we have a very strong digital banking business. Diamond Bank focused on retail mm -hmm. and built an excellent and un an unparalleled retail franchise. It was the fastest growing retail bank. They used their digital capabilities all right, to pursue areas that had to do with financial inclusion, women, um, you know, the vulnerable groups, et cetera. All right? Now, what does this combination bring? It means that you are taking the value chain right from the wholesale customer down to the last mile. It means that things that have to do with payments, for instance, all right, will remain within the system. It means that transmission income is going to be significant. We have, together, we have about 35,000 point of sales terminals. We have 3,300 ATMs. We have a huge reach across the country, mm -hmm. all right? All of these things mean that you don't need to take incremental risk, all right, for us to do well. There were some areas of focus. Let me give you an example. Okay. 
we were known to be leaders as far as supporting, as far as gender empowerment is concerned, which is basically supporting female entrepreneurs or aspiring female entrepreneurs. Diamond also was in that space. That combination means that we lock down that aspect of the business, absolutely. All right, not just in Nigeria, but in other places where we have um, a presence. So there's just so much to be built. Now, what is important now is actually pulling out the efficiencies, mm -hmm. all right, coming from that combination, all right, so that our shareholders and all the other stakeholders can see the benefits. The last point on it, which is for me a very important point, mm -hmm. is that we had an SME focus, albeit slightly different from what Diamond was doing. SMEs represent a critical part of their economy and, and an engine for growth. What this enlarged franchise does is that it now starts supporting more and more and more of the SMEs and their contribution to growth of our GDP and employment and all of those things which government is trying to push, all right, means that for the whole country and for all stakeholders, there's significant value. Okay, let me ask you a follow-up to that, because, you know, you did allude to Diamond Bank having this diverse retail capacity, which is different from what really Access Bank has had yeah. in the past. So for, let's break it down, for that woman or man who has a shop in Onisha Main Market in Anambra, for instance, yes. and has been saving with Diamond Bank over the years, yes. um, can he or she still walk into the banking hall to get the same services they've been getting? And, as at now that we are speaking, though we know that this finalization is till next year, can they still carry out that, those transactions? That's one. Two, what is your, you talked about the POS uh, that you, point of sale service uh, number that you have, but what will be your retail, your customer number post merger? Okay, there is nothing that will change. The benefit of this merger is that we're going to keep all of those unique things about Diamond. They have an incredible mobile banking application. They have a way of reaching the mass market. We must ensure that we keep that emotional connect of that diamond retail customer. Very, very critical. So nothing will change. If anything is going to change, is the fact that they have many more touch points and the fact that for that woman in the market, payment gets easier, all right? If she needs to be paid by any corporate or any business banking type customer, just through your telephone, it's going to happen. So it gets more and more and more efficient. Together, what we have created has 29 million customers, more customers than any other institution in the continent. Now, you can say that there could be some duplications, but we've gone through all of that. If you were to imagine the number of duplications, it's probably another two or three million, all right? So um, you can even call it 25 million customers, still a very sizable um, amount of customers for you to have. And embedded in this is about 10 million mobile customers. It's a great, great, great opportunity. Great opportunity um, that cannot be you know, compared to in any, any other part of the, of the continent. So Diamond Bank has always served pe very small, people with small deposits, let's put, yeah. let's put it that way, as I did so I referred to earlier. And you're talking about the diversity of your client base. You've also mentioned financial inclusion just now and in your official statement about this merger. Yeah. How important is that target of 40 million Nigerians to be, become banked in the next two years? How important is that to you? And can, how can this merger achieve that? It is critical. I mean, um, when I say Diamond Bank, or just as you alluded, Diamond Bank has always served those small customers. Diamond Bank also has a very strong partnership with the largest telecoms company in the country. All right. Reaching that level of financial inclusion under this combination, very easy, much easier than, than, than ever before. And we will continue to serve those customers. And they've developed the unique skills of how to serve those customers. It was not one of our strengths. And that is the benefit of merging these two institutions and making sure that from the corporate end all the way to the last customer, all right, they can be properly, properly served. This thing basically takes banking to tens of millions of customers across the country. We now have the reach. We have the capability of how to serve those customers. We have the right partnerships with fintech companies and GSM companies. And so for us, all those things which the government has wanted to do as far as financial inclusion is concerned, all right, is easily much more attainable now, all right, coming through the financial services sector. You know, there are those who say yes. Uh, when you look at the liabilities and the cash in Diamond Bank, yes, there were problems. Uh, they will also say, you know, there was need for injection of fresh capital. But beyond this, were there any other compelling reasons for you to merge for you as a, uh, uh, as, uh, as a huge bank, a first-year bank that you were? 
you know, there are certain things I've always said, and I keep saying that the best way to predict the future is to create it. You have to disrupt the existing circumstances for you to actually create the future. We are extremely comfortable with the way we are and could have continued to grow organically. Exactly. So what were the compelling reasons? So the compelling you? reason was the fact that we wanted to create, or we want to create, a very strong, largely diversified bank, all right, that will support the growth of our economy. And that is what is being created. We're supporting it with significant capital, all right, to ensure that given the size of that institution, all right, there's robust and sufficient capital in line with international best practice, all right, all the things that have to do with creating buffers for capital, mm -hmm. all right, capital buffers, to ensure that this institution is able to compete, you know, with, with, with its competitors world over. Look back in time. There was a time Nigerian banks were very small, mm -hmm. if you remember, and then a gentleman called uh, Governor Saludo came into, into office mm -hmm. and then increased capital, all right? What happened to Nigerian banks? We grew so much bigger. All right, the likes of Dangote, who would have been struggling to borrow internationally to support the economy, could sit back and discuss with Nigerian banks and raise billions of dollars to expand. That was what started creating this country, if you just look back in time. If you needed to borrow $200 million 20 years ago, you needed to run all over, all over the world. Today, you need to borrow billions of dollars. You get it locally and continue to support. Now, what is all of this doing now? We're, we're creating large institutions that can support local Nigerian businesses and convert them into global corporates. It's a phenomenal, phenomenal thing. And that is what we've tried to achieve. And we have our comparator banks who are of the same size and scale, all right, who are going to be doing the same thing. Let us show that as Nigerians, we have the capacity to create decent institutions and grow our economy. Nobody will support our country as much as ourselves. So the market will be happy, depositors will be happy. What about your shareholders? You've now merged with a bank with a high non-performing loan portfolio. Yes. What about your coveted status as a tier one systematically important bank? Is that not under threat? How much of Diamond Bank's bad loans will you be forced to write off? Let me tell you how it works to know. We are fully cognizant of all of those things. And one of the things we're doing is that Diamond Bank has determined, uh, is determined to write off all of those loans on the date, before the date of legal merge. They will do so in 31st December. They will do so whatever the residue is come next year. That solves that problem permanently. Now, we have enough capital to support the enlarged franchise, which is important. Now, all the benefits of recovering bad loans is just becomes a plus, all right? So we've cut out what is that cancer, taken it out totally, all right? So we have a fresh, clean, brand new franchise, adequately capitalized. So that concern people heard, all right, oh, what is going to happen to... Uh, the non-performing loan book is going to be dealt with decisively. It's taken out. We have an idea. We know exactly what it is, and it will be taken out, and we have enough capital to go on. Even if you didn't recover anything from it, it's a brand new world, all right? But that's not true. We have gone through this many times before, and we, we know how to recover money. So we're going to get the benefits of that recovery coming to profit and ensuring that shareholders um, get you know, adequate returns for, for their investments. Well, the Financial Times is reporting that uh, your bank plans to raise the rights of issue to raise more capital at about $200 um, million next year. Uh, if you have enough capital, why are you raising this? And what time next year, if true, are you raising this capital? We issued a statement this morning, and I think it's in the papers, uh, which is basically calling for an extraordinary general meeting to raise capital. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you what we do. We have traditionally, all right, determined what our minimum capital adequacy ratio should be. Nothing to do with what exists right now. We always create adequate capital buffers. Uh, the Swiss banking model, all right, for instance, in Switzerland, as developed and stable as the economy is, all right, their regulators insist that they keep 19% capital adequacy level. All right? So not to talk of an emerging economy fraught with risks like ours. So we have a determination to ensure that our capital adequacy level is north of 20%. For bank, and because we're a systemically important financial institution with presence across um, several continents, all right, we as a, as a group, it's a, a, bit, a bit more than that. So, all we're trying to do is to ensure that even after the deal, mm -hmm. even though we have enough capital today, given the profits we'll make this year and six months after, we, have, we don't need capital. We believe we need to create capital buffers. Now, let me tell you how complex it gets sometimes. When you have a presence in the UK, all right, there's something referred to as a recovery and resolution plan. 
And so the PRA is always also concerned about the state of the parent. Okay? Now, as a global enterprise which we are creating, we try to make sure that anywhere any of our regulators in any of those countries in which we have a presence, when they look at the parent, they will see the parent as an institution strong enough all right, to continue to ensure that those subsidiaries function properly. So the only reason for this, for this capital raise is to make sure that we create a capital buffer all right, required to be, basically control a much, much larger enterprise. And it's not just um, the rights issue. Mm -hmm. uh, we also um, did a tier two capital raise. And the essence of the tier two capital raise, which is in dollars, is to ensure that even from a currency standpoint, if there was any depreciation of the currency for any reason over time, all right, we have adequate capital to continue to support ourselves. So with, um, what time frame next year are you looking at? You didn't answer that part. Or has the bank not so, decided so when? So my EGM, my EGM is going to be in on the 1st of February. Um, it's already been announced. Um, I reckon that in the second quarter of next year, we will, we will raise the, the, do the right issue. Because some will wonder, I mean, this is right during on after the general elections. Don't you think that that's such a bit of a problem? Uh, raising such capital after the general elections in the country? Our stakeholders have infinite confidence in our, in, in, in our institution, um, and I'm certain that they will support us. We've done it several times before. There's never a good time. Um, you have elections, the next thing, something else would happen, etc. cetera. Um, this is basically a call on the stakeholders whom I know will support as they've supported before, so I don't, I don't, I don't envisage any, any, any issues. And by the way, the, the rights issue is also available for existing shareholders of, 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 of the enlarged bank, which is also diamond shareholders and stakeholders. So I remain confident that we'll raise the money. It's, it's not a lot of money. Okay, we'll be taking a short break at this point. Mm -hmm. Stay with us, and when we return, we'll continue with Mr. Herbert Wigwe, Managing Director of Access Bank PLC. Welcome back to The Morning Show. Still here with us is Mr. Herbert Wigway, Managing Director of Access Bank PLC. Now, the public is often quick to cheer when we hear news of a merger or acquisition in the banking sector, right. mm -hmm. but we don't know or appreciate the kind of work that goes on behind the scenes to make these yeah. transactions seamless. So can you give us a peek behind the curtain? What is the procedure that you have to undertake to fully integrate two completely different entities cultures and personnel, and how long does it take? It's a lot of work, it's a lot of work. The first thing that you would normally do, and depending, every measure is different, every measure is different. Um, you would normally set up an integration committee, you have a steering committee, um, of course you would have different committees referred, required to ensure that the business as usual does not suffer. So basically, the traditional lights on while you're going about doing the integration. And then in the integration committee, in our case and what we're doing now, is that you create work streams, work streams around systems, around processes, all right, making sure the alignments happen around people. That's the most difficult aspect of it, all right. Around culture, you separate people from culture because people issues may be various pain points. Um, how do you harmonize um, pay between the two institutions? What do you do to direct sales agents? How do you retool or reskill re people, etc.? Now, culture is different. Uh, it refers to the norms and practices of the two institutions. How do you integrate it? Now, that takes a lot longer. It doesn't happen in one day. It doesn't happen in one week. It doesn't happen in one month. All right, it takes a little longer. Now, so there are about 13 or 14 different work streams. All right, and people have to work day and night. How do you ensure that there's a technology um, alignment? So, for instance, in Diamond Bank, all right, the Diamond customer must continue to use the same account. They must not feel any pain. They must continue to use that application without any pain. It has to be seamless. You have to ensure that the branding retains the emotional connect that those customers had to that institution. You know, if you get so those are all the different streams that need to be worked on. So people work tirelessly over time, and that makes the difference between what is a successful merger and what is not successful from an acquisition standpoint. Because you know, if you don't get the people working together. If you don't get trust amongst within the two institutions and you start segregating one set of people from the other, then their ability to engage customers is threatened. And the customers will vote by just leaving the bank and taking their money out. 
So you have to make sure all of those elements are working very closely together. Now, it's something we've done not once, not twice, not three times. So we've become quite adept at it, all right? You will never get it 100%, but you know, certainly in this case, we will get it 95%. Um, we have already started engaging our brothers and sisters in Diamond, mm -hmm. all right? And we are one family. We will do all the various um, road shows to customers because customers ask, oh, what happens to my Diamond? No, 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 absolutely safe. Continue doing what you're doing. It's business as usual. In fact, if anything, we start ensuring that things we do within the two institutions are the same. So whether you are a Diamond customer or Access customer, if you go to my ATM, it's free of charge. Let the customer start seeing us as one and then start benefiting from the products of services of either, if you get the point I'm trying to make. So these things take a bit of time. So the physical aspects of integration will happen and will, it will become manifest by uh, the end of, by the time you have a proper legal merge. But the cultural aspect continues, all right, because it takes time to build trust. And these are people you've not worked with before, all right, and all of that. But the good thing, though, is that we have, we pretty much have the same DNA, a bit different, mm -hmm. all right, um, over time. And I think it is not difficult for us to harmonize it. It would require a bit of talking, but, you know, it's, 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 it's not that difficult. This would definitely bolster confidence in the customers who otherwise would have feared or oh, this integration would affect them in some way or the other. But talking about streamlining and integration, how much of staff and branch rationalization are we expecting? To what extent are you doing this? So I've had many people say things about people leaving. Mm -hmm. I'm not planning for any diamond person to leave. That's not the idea. We're optimizing our people. We're retraining people. Um, they've done an excellent job as far as retail is concerned. We're taking it and plugging in into access. Now, the issue about branch rationalization has to be handled very carefully because you'll be totally shocked as to the relationships and interactions and customer behaviors across branches. Okay. So let me give you a simple example. The relationship between customers in Idumota and Onicha, you'll be shocked that there is a very strong correlation. So if you rush to go and close a branch, it must affect your liability. So it requires some deep analytics, all right, for you to get there. Now, we, can, we have an idea what it may come to, but the whole idea is that you now take the staff from there, you retool them or reskill them, all right, and apply them differently within the institution. It's the same argument people used to have and say, technology will replace human beings. It's not going to happen. People are going to develop new skills and be used differently. So we have absolutely no intention of asking people to go zilch, all right? They will stay and we'll use them differently. We'll use them differently in retail, we'll use them differently in operations, all right, to optimize the larger franchise. We know that people are expecting issues from an integration standpoint. Mm -hmm. But I think they're making a mistake because this is one thing that we have perfected. We've done several times, all right? And we've become very, very um, expert at it, all right? This integration is gonna be seamless, absolutely. You sound like you're about to acquire or merge with another second tier bank. You're Not so really. confident. Not really. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> with this merger, what legacy are you hoping to leave as a CEO? At the time I'm leaving, I want to ensure that we have a sustainable institution. I must be able to see the second, third, and fourth generation of leadership in this institution. I don't want to create a Titanic. We want an institution that, you know, should so people leave, successive leaders leave, all right? The institution will be able to stand the test of time. We're a global institution in the making. Um, we want to see our people standing side by side with their comparators in Citibank. And I'm not talking about just here, I'm talking of in New York. I stand side by side with their comparators in JP Morgan, in HSBC, in Santander. That's the type of institution we want to create. And to ensure that we run away from all the issues around disintermediation, all right, that is a problem in Africa. And that we ourselves are present in global financial markets and can support our businesses and African trade all right, uh, by ourselves. It's, it's, it's extremely important for me. As things stand now in the capital market, GTB is the bellwether stock. Oh, yes. Do you see Access Bank taking over that position now that you are the biggest bank in the country? I don't know about being the biggest bank in the country. That's not what is important to me. Um, I think our comparative banks have done exceedingly well. They are efficient. They are big. They have the reach. I think we've grown and we've come of age. I think it is for us to pull out the efficiencies, all right, and the market will tell. Um, it will happen in 2019. They will see it in 2020. You know what it means to have 29 million customers or 25 million customers? 
pulling out the efficiencies from them, it changes the landscape totally. And the more efficient we get, all right, the greater value you will see to shareholders. The share price will reflect it. And I remain extremely confident. I mean, people have asked questions about, oh, how many shares do you have an issue? How are you going to be able to support all of these shares? Um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Very and absolutely clear in my mind. Once we pull out these efficiencies, it will show in the profitability, to show the return on equity. And all of those things will determine share price. It's a great feature for all access shareholders and stakeholders. I'm, when I'm talking about access, I'm talking both on behalf of access and diamond. Well, uh, there are four subsidiaries of Diamond Bank, um, including a bank in the UK. Are you taking on the subsidiaries or are you selling them off? No, they have actually sold most of them. Um, the one in the UK is going through its final approvals and will be sold. And whenever the money comes, and I think it will come before legal merge, it will go into, um, into, into Diamond Bank. Um, and there's no need to duplicate it because we have a very, very, very strong presence in the UK, even if I say so myself. All right, so I think you know, that's how we're going to treat it. Um, we have a reach across the continent. You know, Diamond Bank fortunately had sold um, um, its, its subsidiaries in, in Cote d'Ivoire and all of that. And I don't think it's, it's, it's necessary uh, for us to, to go and uh, set up in countries that we're not taking a strategic decision to set up in before. How about the Diamond Bank pension custodian? Are you taking that up as well? So we're reviewing it. Um, obviously, there are implications. Okay. Um, so, What's and there, the implications are there? No, the, the, the implications are there are rules that come from the uh, Pension Commission with respect to um, if you have an, a subsidiary of that nature, what do you do with it? Mm -hmm. So we'll have to take a decision whether to keep it or to sell it. Mm -hmm. uh, that decision has not been taken yet, and, and it will happen in due, in due course. And, and very quickly, um, the CBN has said no obligations to this merger, but the SEC, as, as at the latest uh, press release, says you have sent a letter of intention, but is now aware that this merger has taken place. What's the latest on that? There are different stages as far as the different authorizations you need. Uh -huh. We have the no objection. We've notified the Stock Exchange. We've also notified the Securities and Exchange Commission. We will get their consent. We will then go to have the extraordinary, the court ordered meetings and all of that. So there are different, different stages, but our primary regulator has issued the no objection letter. In fact, we need to still get another level of approval, which is an approval in principle from them before you get the final approval. So all of these things are being worked out by our investment bankers and we're pursuing them. But before, before end of um, May, I think it will, be, it will be done. Definitely by the first end of the half year, we'd have concluded the legal merge. It's a standard, it's a very standard process. So in conclusion, do you have any final words for all stakeholders affected by the merger? It's a great time and it's a great opportunity. Um, and the assurance I, wanted to, I want to give all stakeholders, and I'm talking about staff, shareholders, um, customers, most importantly, is the fact that this is a brand new world. And there is something in it for everybody, particularly our customers. And those who did not get enough of what they wanted in Diamond, now they have access to a larger platform to get. And it remains a safe institution. Uh, for staff, obviously, um, I'm communicating with everybody. We're not talking about asking people to go. That's certainly not on the table. All right, we, all we seek to do is to create a value accretive um, enterprise. And I think for our regulators, what is important and what is critical is that we create a safe institution, adequately capitalized, and that is already, already happening. But I think for government, the best way to look at it is that we've created an institution that will support the growth of our GDP, an institution that will support SMEs, that will lead to greater financial inclusion, greater financial deepening, and all of those things which are required to propel an economy. And that is what, 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 what I have to say. And um, the trust and confidence that, that the marketplace has in us um, is one I just ask for, all right? And let us show that as Nigerians, we can create a true oasis of sanity. Thank you. Thanks. Great well, pleasure. Joining Thank us, you. Mr. Habit with it this morning. Well, it's not time for a short break on The Morning Show. When we return, we'll have the Arise News correspondent, Aaron Akarijala, join us with a review of the top stories on today's newspapers. Please stay with us. <laughs>